Hi everyone, so this is the uh, second part of our three-part mini-series called The Shape of Space. I should really have called it The Shape of Space Time, but I didn't want to be too pedantic about it. The Shape of Space, in other words, the, the overall shape of the universe is what is going to determine the future of the universe. So it's kind of an important question, both in cosmology and in mathematics as well, because cosmology is a very mathematical subject. And that's why I'm including it as part of the Discover Maths um, channel. Now, in this second part, we're going to be looking mainly at Einstein's general theory of relativity and the nature of space-time and how we can determine what the shape of the universe is by looking at the matter and energy within it. So let's discover more about the maths of space, the shape of space and the future of the universe. For all his brilliance, Einstein was no outstanding mathematician. He knew about Gauss's theory of surfaces from his student days and turned to his friend and old classmate Marcel Grossman for further insights. What he discovered had a profound effect on him and his progress toward a new theory of gravity. In all my life I have not laboured nearly so hard and I have become imbued with great respect for mathematics, the subtler part of which I had in my simple mindedness regarded as pure luxury until now. Grossman told Einstein of Riemann's work and the more recent breakthroughs made by Italian mathematician Gregorio Ricci Cabastro, often referred to simply as Ricci, and his brilliant student Tullio Levisavita. The two Italians had developed a new subject known as tensor calculus. Tensors are a generalization of vectors, quantities with size and direction, to any number of dimensions. The maths of tensors was to prove absolutely crucial to the formulation of Einstein's field equations, which lie at the heart of the general theory of relativity. Forty years earlier, William Clifford had speculated that mass, and by extension the force of gravity, might be an outcome of the local curvature of space. In the new world of Einsteinian physics, however, it isn't space alone that's curved, but the union of space and time. This idea that the three dimensions of space and the one of time are inseparable was first proposed by French mathematician Henri Poincaré in 1905. It's also inherent in the special theory of relativity, although it wasn't until 1908 that German mathematician Hermann Minkowski, who'd once taught Einstein and called him a lazy dog, supplied a complete geometric model of the fusion of space and time. The curvature that appears in the general theory of relativity is the curvature of Minkowski's space-time continuum. Forget trying to conjure up an accurate mental picture of space-time. We think exclusively in terms of Euclidean 3D space because that's what we see around us and what our brains are attuned to. Time seems to be something else altogether, a kind of other direction in which things travel from past to future. It's easy to grasp curvature of a 2D space, that's essentially what happens when a flat map of the world, cut into a series of curved sectors or gores, is folded onto the surface of a globe. A 2D space is called a surface, and we can visualise it being either flat, as in the case of a plane, or curved. A surface in an arbitrary number of dimensions goes by the more general name manifold. We don't normally think of the 3D space around us as having a surface, yet it does. We can only imagine this surface if it's Euclidean, the equivalent of flat in 2D. It's impossible to close your eyes and see a 3D surface or manifold that's bent in any way. It's doubly impossible to imagine a 4D manifold like that of the space-time continuum that's curved. But what we can imagine is irrelevant because maths transcends the power of humans to visualize. In applying the mathematics developed by Riemann, Ricci, Levi-Civita and others to Minkowski spacetime, Einstein showed that the curvature of the 4D surface or manifold in which we're embedded is determined by the distribution of matter. 
As an aid to imagination to give an inkling of the true situation, the surface of space-time is sometimes likened to a stretched rubber sheet, such as that of a trampoline. Anything that weighs on the sheet causes it to sink down. In a similar way, the sun, for instance, gives rise to a dip or depression in the local surface of space-time. Anything in the vicinity of this dip will have its motion affected by the curvature. A light ray from a distant star passing close to the sun will be deflected, its path bent slightly sunward. Likewise, Earth and the other planets of the solar system have their paths bent into ellipses or near circles, just as the path of marble follows a curved trajectory when spun around the rim of a steep-sided bowl. The path followed by any free-moving object through space-time is known as a geodesic and is the shortest way to get between two points. If the surface of space-time is curved, then the geodesic will be curved. Geodesics on Earth's surface are arcs of great circles, which explains why airliners follow such routes on long-haul flights. When depicted on a flat map, the arc of a great circle that links two cities on different continents seems far from being the shortest connecting path. On a sphere, however, it becomes clear that there's no other path more efficient in length. Light rays and other free-moving things, such as planets and other celestial objects, will always follow geodesics through space-time. These shortest possible paths are curved in the neighbourhood of a gravitating mass, noticeably so if the mass is large. Before Einstein, physicists thought only in terms of gravitational effects and the force of gravity exerted by all material things. We can still do that today. The Newtonian view of gravity works just fine for most purposes. But we now know that the force of gravity is really just a manifestation of variations in the local geometry of space-time. There's no need to scratch our heads wondering what could cause an invisible interaction to pull everything in the vicinity toward an object with mass. Thanks to the general theory of relativity, it's possible to see all occurrences of gravity as the natural behaviour of objects in moving the shortest distances possible across the curved surface of the space-time continuum. Anything that has mass curves the space-time nearby. By the same token, all of the mass in the universe combined curves all of space-time. The big question is, what's the nature of this overall cosmic curvature? There are three possibilities. The surface of the universe might be closed, like that of a sphere. It might be open, stretching away forever in all directions, as in the case of a hyperboloid, or it might be exactly flat. In their original form, the field equations of general relativity insist that the universe can't be static. It must be either expanding or contracting. At the time the equations were first published, the prevailing view was that the universe was fixed in size. Astronomers had yet to discover that there were other galaxies beyond our own, let alone that most of these galaxies were flying away from us. To bring his theory into line with mainstream astronomical opinion, Einstein in 1917 introduced a quantity represented by lambda, which became known as the cosmological constant. Inserted into his field equations, it exactly balanced out any tendency for the universe to change in size. He later described it as the biggest blunder of my life because by introducing a fudge factor, he missed predicting one of the great breakthroughs of the 20th century. In the early 1930s, evidence from observational astronomers such as Edwin Hubble showed that the galaxies were speeding apart. Their outward rush presumed then, as now, to be a result of the stretching fabric of space-time. Today, we know beyond reasonable doubt that the universe is expanding and that this expansion began about 13.8 billion years ago in an event known as the Big Bang. Until quite recently, it was thought that the ultimate fate of the universe depended only on the average density of matter in space. Above a certain critical density, there'd be enough matter in total to close the surface of space-time so that eventually the universe would expand to a certain maximum size and then shrink back down before ending in a big crunch. Below the critical density, the universe would be open and its contents destined to spread further and further apart, although at a gradually slowing rate over an eternal period of time.
The ratio of the actual density to the critical density is a parameter known as omega. As acceptance of the expanding universe grew, Einstein abandoned his cosmological constant. It seemed as if the only game in town now was to measure omega, and for this astronomers turned to their telescopes and other instruments. But it's no easy task getting an accurate value for how much mass there is on average in a given volume of space. Account has to be taken of the fact that matter is clumped into galaxies and galaxies into clusters and galaxy clusters into superclusters with great voids in between. To have any chance of being near the mark, estimates have to be based on accurate models of the large scale structure of the cosmos, which entails mapping the distribution of galaxies out to distances of billions of light years. As well as the ordinary mass found in stars, planets, and the gas and dust between stars, factored in has to be the effective mass of photons, particles of light, and neutrinos, ghostly particles that travel at very near the speed of light. These contributions together, astronomers came to realize as their measurements improved, gave a value for omega that fell well short of what was needed to close the universe. But then, two astonishing discoveries were made. Data hinting at the first of these breakthroughs were first collected as long ago as 1933 by Swiss-American astronomer Fritz Zwicky. He was observing the speeds at which galaxies moved within the Coma Cluster, a grouping of about a thousand galaxies that lie some 340 million light-years away. The speeds were too high, he found, to be explained by the total mass of the cluster. Travelling as fast as they were, the galaxies ought to break free into the intercluster void. For the coma cluster to remain bound together, Zwicky proposed, it must contain vast amounts of what he called dunkel matry, German for dark matter. In fact, it must have a mass far in excess of that which could be accounted for by adding together all the cluster's luminous contents. More than 40 years went by before Zwicky's suggestion was revitalized. In the late 1970s, studies of the rotation of spiral galaxies made it hard to avoid the conclusion that dark matter really does exist and in great quantities. The stars in the outer parts of the galaxies observed were orbiting around the center much faster than could be explained by the sum total of all the bright material on display. It seemed as if there was enormous spherical halo of unseen material in which the visible parts of each galaxy were embedded. That conclusion remains true today. Only about 17% of the matter in the universe is thought to be in a form that's detectable by the light or other forms of electromagnetic radiation, radio, infrared, ultraviolet and so on that it gives off. The rest is dark invisible to any of our detection equipment, and apparently of a completely different nature to the particles of which ordinary matter is made. Dark matter, whatever it is, bumps up the overall average density of matter in the universe, but even with the massive boost from this mysterious denizen of the cosmos, the calculated value of omega still comes out well below one, the figure at which the universe pivots from being infinite in size and doomed to eternal expansion to being closed and destined eventually to collapse. If dark matter came as a shock to astronomers, it was nothing compared to the utterly unexpected discovery of another previously unsuspected component of the universe in which we live. It had been assumed that whatever the curvature of space-time, the rate of expansion of the universe must be slowing. In Newtonian terms, the mutual pull of gravity of all the galaxies serves as a break against the outward rush of matter that's been going on since the Big Bang. This mutual pull must inevitably, over time it seemed, reduce the speed at which matter moved apart, irrespective of whether the expansion was eventually going to reverse or not. But then came a startling revelation. Thank you.